What is PTSD? Let's get down to the basics. Welcome back to the channel, folks. Dr. Sharma here, board certified psychiatrist and Air Force veteran. As always, I wanted to mention that this video is for informational purposes only. It is not medical or psychiatric advice. Please discuss your individual symptoms with your physician, provider, or therapist. In this video, I wanted to get into what PTSD actually is. And I don't mean the criteria for the condition and what symptoms someone needs to have to get the diagnosis. That's easy enough to Google or find on the DSM criteria. What I mean is what actually happens in the brain. And that is one of the most important things in any condition, but especially mental illness. It helps to understand the underlying reasons of why that condition exists in us. Whenever I talk to patients and veterans, after I go through one of these explanations, they always tell me that they feel a little bit better knowing where the symptoms actually come from. The best way we can do this is with a case study. This case is completely anonymized. It's not based on an actual person, just combining different factors from multiple patients I've seen over the years. So it's pretty much made up. So Richard is deployed to Iraq. While there, he has to run convoys, and he's frequently manning the gun in these convoys. As a result, his head is constantly on a swivel, looking around and maintaining convoy security. Now let's take a step back. Let me tell you briefly about the fight or flight center in the brain. This is called the amygdala. Now our amygdala is only supposed to be activated for brief periods of time, like when a bear jumps out of the woods and we have to decide what to do. This is helpful from an evolutionary point of view because in that fight or flight response, our heart rate increases, our blood flow diverts to our skeletal muscles so that we can fight or run, our breathing becomes faster, and we have adrenaline flowing through our body so we can know what we need to do and we're stronger. However, the amygdala is not designed to be activated for long periods of time continuously. So back to Richard in Iraq. His amygdala is on for long periods of time. This includes during long convoys that take hours, sometimes days. Even when he goes to these forward operating bases, these FOBs, and these larger bases, his amygdala is still on frequently because of mortar strikes and other threats. His fight or flight response stays on for pretty much the whole deployment. Keep in mind that when we go into the fight or flight response, other hormones in the body and chemicals are released, including cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And cortisol does a lot of things in the body, like it does reduce inflammation. One of the most significant is that it causes an increase in blood sugar, it can cause increase in anxiety, weight gain, and a host of other symptoms, especially when it's chronically high over time. So then Richard returns to the United States. He notices that even though he's back and out of harm's way, he still has his head on a swivel, he's hypervigilant, constantly looking around for threats, even when walking in Walmart, and he has trouble staying in the present moment. This is a sign that his amygdala is still activated at a very high level. The reason why is the amygdala and the brain does not understand that he is in a safe environment now. Now the hope is that these effects will only last for a few weeks or maybe a few months and then it resolves. When this happens, that is more like an acute stress disorder, which you can think of as kind of like PTSD light. Of course, it frequently does not stop and it continues to become PTSD. This is when the amygdala just does not stop being hyperactive. It continues to keep Richard's hypervigilance at a very high level. It increases his anxiety. It changes the way he perceives people and things in his environment and maybe even causes physiological changes like increased blood pressure, weight gain, increased blood sugar, and more. Obviously, having the amygdala activated at a high level for a very long time is very draining on the body, so it can even lead to fatigue, problems with concentration, and other changes. Now, if you have PTSD or you know someone who does, you might be wondering about the other effects it has on the brain. Let's go back to the amygdala. Studies with functional MRI scans have shown that when the amygdala is hyperactive, Another part of the brain is hypoactive, meaning it doesn't light up as much as the amygdala on these scans. That part of the brain is also called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, DLPFC. 
The name doesn't matter, but we can think of this as the center for executive function and cognitive control. So this includes memory, focus, organization, planning, and similar skills. This is also why folks with significant PTSD symptoms will notice short and long-term memory impairment, needing to read information multiple times before being able to really comprehend it, having trouble organizing themselves to do things or even get out the door, having trouble with planning activities, having trouble with weighing the pros and cons of certain decisions and even making decisions, and more. You can imagine this causes significant impacts on the person's personal life and work life. A lot of veterans will tell me that because of the PTSD and anxiety, they just can't seem to live in the present moment. They have a lot of difficulties being distracted, even when they're with their families in situations that are supposed to be joyful. They worry about threats in the environment. They may even perceive threats in the environment where there aren't any. This may also lead to obsessive activities like checking locks, doors, alarms, camera feeds multiple times. This is because of intrusive thoughts about something terrible happening like a home invasion or something like that. This happens because the amygdala is still trying to keep you safe and does not understand that now you're in a safe environment. This problem with being in the present moment obviously decreases the person's quality of life and even causes problems in their relationships. Now, you might be asking, isn't a certain degree of situational awareness or hypervigilance good? Yes, in the military they teach us situational awareness, and it's good to be aware of your surroundings, of potential threats. But you don't want it to get to a problematic level, right? So there's the normal situational awareness, but it can rise to the level where it's interfering with your relationships, with your quality of life, enjoyment, your functioning at work, and things like that. So you always want to take it back to when does it become problematic. So treatments for PTSD typically focus on decreasing activity in the amygdala, tamping it down so that the person is calmer, more able to be present, breathe, and function. When you calm down the amygdala, that also allows the DLPFC, that's the part that does the executive functioning and cognitive control, that allows that part to be stronger. So treatments include cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure therapy, medication, and more. That's it for today's video. I hope this was helpful for you to take a deeper look at PTSD and what it actually is from the brain perspective. If you found this helpful, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. It really helps and it also tells me that I'm doing something right. Also, please drop a comment below if you have a request on a topic that you want me to cover. I'd be happy to make a video on it as well. As always, thanks for watching. Dr. Sharma signing off. See you next time.